which is um, organizing the volunteers and then formalizing suspension of policy monitoring reports until um, further notice. Uh, and the other thing I just told Jim, and Grant, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've already approved one of those warnings from last board meeting. So there's an extra warrant. Yeah, there's an extra warrant. Okay. Okay. Um, Excellent. Uh, any public comment? Any public comment on Zoom? If you just want to. Nope. Nope. Exactly the one. Okay. Oh, okay. Right there. Right there. <laughs> Not that far away. Um, excellent. Uh, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda with the October 15th warrant removed because we discussed it. We approved it last time. Approved it last time, so I have to approve it again. Um, do I have a second for that motion? I'll second it. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. Uh, next uh, item is board action. Um, which we're going to very appreciatively appoint Jill uh, to the Regional Advisory Board for the uh, Central Vermont Career Center. Again, thanks for all your great work there. You're um, do I have a motion to appoint Jill uh, to the Regional Advisory Board for EVCC? Second. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? She's going to be the chair. Ooh, congrats. Yeah, this is what happens when you miss a meeting. You get appointed yeah. chair of a Thank you, Jill, for doing this. Thank you so pleasure. much. My pleasure. I'll have a pretty substantial update for you all in, in the coming few weeks, depending on how that wraps up in the next couple weeks. So. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you for doing that. And thank you for taking on chair. You'll, you'll be fantastic. Four nominators. <laughs> like, Joe Remick will do it. Well, she living. I said, I'm not going to be one of my board members. <laughs> that, that was nice of you. <laughs> um, do we want to do the, well, let's um, not take up Grant and Andrew's time. Uh, so potential financing infrastructure needs, uh, Andrew and Grant um, and I know we all know you, but you might want to introduce yourselves for the people on television. I'll go first, and I'm also going to walk around and hand out hard copies. I am Grant Geisler. I'm the business manager. Andrew LaRosa, director of facilities. So that's my big job. And then we hand out hard copies. It's designed to be shared as a PDF. We made a couple little minor changes, so I just wanted you to have the most current copy, and then you can. Uh, you can jot down any notes you have on it. Can, can we also just mention that whatever we post is online, that is the version that yep. we're talking about now that we just. Yep. Okay, I'm going to just set up some context for this, and then I'm sure you'll have some questions. And, and fortunately for us, Andrew's here, and he knows a lot about all these specifics. Um, just to start out, what I wanted to point out is that this sheet tracks very closely to the presentation that Andrew did, I think it was August 18th, when we went over some projects. So a lot of these should be reflected in what you've already seen. Um, 
As far as the columns go, these are the projects, obviously. We have several columns, ESSER 3, fund balance, capital plan, and other, which other is largely what we're hoping is infrastructure money that comes down. Um, the capital plan, that column, the entries that are in there are for windows, um, UES auditorium and multi-purpose renovations. Those are there because they've already been in our capital plan. So I just left them there. Um, we also added the Main Street Sustainability Lab. Mostly I put it there just because it was about the right amount of money. So we, we plugged it into the capital plan. The, um, background of how we came to where we are here. Mm -hmm. So we came to the board on August 18th for the overall, like here are all the things we're thinking about, right? If you all remember that. Um, we took your feedback. We, Grant would had a better sense from the audit that came through the, uh, that we haven't seen yet as a board, but um, he's got some sense from the auditors around what's, what the actual fund balance, you know, what, what actually do we have in the bank account? Um, so Andrew, Grant and I started our budget brainstorming with our administrative teams and we, the three of us sat down after we did that brainstorming and said, okay, so we have this list of brainstormed ideas. We got feedback from the board, initial feedback from the board. Where might we, you know, where, where would it make sense to put these things? So this uh, form right here is not necessary. This is not a done deal. There's nothing written in stone. There's no dollars spent yet. This is getting your feedback, right? So Jim and I have also talked about going out with our mutual thought exchange after this presentation and using your feedback, revising it if necessary, and then going out to the community because part of it has to do with us, our professor. Does that make sense? So nothing is written in stone here. The other thing I wanna say for this particular presentation, and I know it may be hard, is that we're not talking about the academic, social, emotional engagement piece around our professor. That's not the purpose of this conversation. It's just like we've kind of split these the ideas in our heads. <laughs> um, so we're not prepared to talk about that tonight. Uh, we're starting to get ideas, most definitely, but we're just not prepared to talk about it. So this is simply the infrastructure with the different funding sources we have available to us. Does that make sense? All right, sorry, and, Grant. And just another piece, another piece of where these, why these buckets went into different buckets was time frame with regards to when we knew the money was gonna be available, when the money had to be spent and how long we needed to plan for some of these projects. So if it was a big project that was very complicated, well, that's tough to spend money that we need to spend very quickly on because we just wouldn't have planning for it. So that was another component that went into where we shuffled things. And in essence, kind of what I think Andrew's quote to me earlier was, it's basically just taking everything that's in the air and just putting it on a piece of paper for now and capturing everything. Um, the reason why we selected in addition to timing Capital, I put stuff in the capital that was already in the capital. Um, as far as fund balance, um, I, the track is the big one I put here. And the reason why I chose to put it under fund balance instead of say ESSER 3 was it's one huge project. And I don't think it makes sense to, to use like almost all of the ESSER 3 money for something like one project at one school. So that fell into the fund balance column. Um, kind of maybe some lower priority or pure infrastructure requirements. And when I say pure infrastructure, an example is like the addition roof at Main Street to replace that. That's, I mean, that's pure infrastructure. So that went into the other column. So kind of what you're left with in the ESSER 3 column are higher priority kind of student focused projects where we could do several things that would be exciting from a kid perspective. And that's kind of how we played this out. The costs that I've highlighted, you can see at the top, we say definitely these are rough relative estimates. You know, we haven't had an engineer look at these and price them out yet. This is very early in the game, but these are kind of rough estimates. Um, and then I was gonna end by kind of saying what Libby already mentioned. This is really just a plan to get organized, get our thoughts organized on where things were. So it's more like something to react to for both you and the community in total. The totals at the bottom, like ESSER 3, 1.65 million, that certainly could be. Um, the total amount that we have is over 2.2. So 
Um, the possibility is you could spend up to, I think, 1.73. Certainly, we could spend 165. We could spend more. We could spend less. Uh, the fund balance amount, we just went over this, and you saw it in your quarterly report. The number I'm showing is like 1.747, I think. So 1.7 is within that realm. The capital, if you're looking at about 260 inflated every year through FY30, then you're easily at almost, you know, 2.2 million maybe. Um, so those are where the totals are. And I tried to kind of stay within those totals that are available. And, um, and Andrew on the right side of this kind of showed some, uh, some scheduling, like when we would do design permitting and building and when the construction could actually begin. So I think that's all I can add to it. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. Yeah, to the, the only other thing I would say is, is the, the good thing about the capital and the infrastructure is we have no idea what that infrastructure number is going to be. If that infrastructure number is bigger, those projects seem like they're going to be easy ones to slide out of the capital fund into that. And whether that opens up more opportunities or lessens the burdens, the, you know, the need for a capital fund, who knows? We'll, we'll see how that, we'll see what that number is when that number gets here. Yeah, with regards to the schedule, again, there's just so many projects and sort of talking about them and when we could do them. I just wanted to do a kind of a quick, reasonable, okay, where where do we, what are projects that if you guys, if, if was given the, the go ahead, you know, what could we easily design this winter, have bid documents by no later than March-ish so that we could get constructed. There's some of them that are relatively easy um, and those, are reflected in spring design and summer construction. Some of the other ones, you know, a special ed suite, I don't think anybody has the capacity to envision what a special ed suite for the next 25 years, that's gonna serve the district for 25 years, is going to happen this winter. <laughs> I think we gotta get, get through this school year, take a breather, and then look at those things. So that's why they, they sort of shifted and, and how they go out. And as well as things like the track, uh, to just give a sense that that track, if, if we did a track project, that's gonna take, it's gonna take a long time to do. Uh, potentially. So that's, and again, if there was something that shifted, this is still, I mean, we, I, I had a project up in Stowe one time where there was a, a, a donation for a new science lab and the caveat was that it had to be done for the, for the start of school the next year and the money was given in like April and they got new science labs. So everything's possible, but it's not the best way to do things. So um, like I said, we just, we just wanted to get this on paper. So there was had something to react to and. No, I, I know I did see, uh, I think some questions that came in from Mia um, and I'm trying to remember all of them. Um, the resiliency space at MSMS has truly, uh, there was a misunderstanding of what that space is used for now. And, and so it's not used for that. And we have actually alternative ideas. So that resiliency space would potentially be alternative programming. So we're looking at a completely different model, completely different space at MSMS. So it's just based on our needs that we're experiencing this year. Um, so it's just a completely different idea that we will come talk to you all about, but it fits more on the academic, social, emotional, behavior side. Um, so that resiliency room was crossed out because we got a different idea. <laughs> we need a different space. Um, and then the staff work at room at UES, that was one of the really nice ideas, nice to have. Um, and we can probably do some stiffen up we with our regular, away Andrew's regular budget. So it just wasn't a priority when we had to cross something, some things off. Then the town hall access has been something we've talked about um, since Roxbury Montpelier merged. Uh, the town hall is not, not double negative. It is accessible to all people. The challenge is you go through the school in order to make it accessible. So this, this was kind of nice because then you wouldn't have to do that. However, it's not a problem. Like we have no problems with people walking through, you know, to, to access the town hall. So it's not like it's a dilemma. And, right? and that's, and that's could be a legacy from when I first took the job. One of the first things when the first visit to the school was, oh, we want to close this off and separate it. And that's just sort of stuck in my mind. And, reality but really hasn't nobody, really been a problem yeah and, nobody's uh, talking about it anymore, yeah, yeah. So, so that was why that one was crossed off and there was another a question that was somewhere along the lines of you know maybe we would want to do a bond is it you know should we look at doing a bond 
I mean, that's obviously your call and the community's call. My position on it was, you know, we just did a bond, pretty sizable bond recently. None of our bonds are gonna be paid off until I think the first year is FY30. So FY30, we'll see a drop in our long-term debt and it's only like 75,000. So we have pretty stable long-term debt for a while. So my, my vote would be, you know, we've got a pretty large amount of money coming in already. So, I mean, this would keep us pretty busy to take care of this. So I would vote for holding off on any bond ideas for a while at least. federal money coming into the district mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I would agree with anything else. She asked um, how confident you are the amounts are relatively close to the real cost, which I think you guys have addressed. And then um, it seems to leave about 600K of ESSER three funds. Are they accounted for somewhere else? Um, yeah, and the, the total ESSER three amount is like 2.2 something million. We plan on using that for math interventionists, um, I think maybe even another- like We're still final talking year. about all the different uses for that. We're, yeah. we're I mean, there's some that we already know that we were planning on going, but then there's more that we could spend. So it could even be less than 1.65. I just certainly wasn't gonna use more than that chunk because of the conversation that still needs to happen. So I have a question on the resiliency space. If you're re- thinking of that idea and it's going to be something else. Um, is that going to be added here? Or? The alternative programming. Oh, okay. It'd be the alternative programming line. So, okay, that's what I have. Okay, cool. I just wondered about the items that are spring 22. Um, you know, windows and door hardware and things like that. Are, the, are those already purchased or do you have any concern about getting those because of all these supply chain issues? Uh, the year, absolutely. So, we did a, we're doing a beta test at the union for windows. Our screens, which were ordered on June 19th, are arriving tomorrow, are on arriving for installation on Friday. Four window screens, and it's been close to six months. So absolutely, everything is, there's not a yellowish enough highlighter to, <laughs> to reinforce the estimate. And, and really, this, I say it every year, but this is definitely going to be a year that any project we choose, we need to make sure that it's worth the effort that we put it, that it can stand alone and it doesn't impair because our, you know, people are going to be tired at the end of this year. And um, unless it's, unless we can make it very isolated and controlled and a lot of outside forces, I, I'm going to say, let's kick the can for, for another summer for this. It's the beauty of schools. It was very nervous when I first got here. I was like, oh, I've got to get everything done. That's like, well, we've been here for 200 years. We're going to be here for another 500 years. We can, six months is not that big of a deal. We, we'll get there. We'll get there. So, but absolutely. And that's, that's, that's definitely the note up here. You know, we, we need to, if we, there's stuff that we want to do for next year, we need to make decisions early winter. We, we can't wait until after town meeting and expect any, you're not going to have the in, things together in the bid. Yeah. Yeah. We want to lump, that's the other thing that you're going to save money here is, the more we can lump them, the more we're going to save. And, and um, so, so pushing it to another summer just gives us more time to plan, gives us more time to design, and, and um, doing things in a rush is not the best way to do any construction. And any, the, um, the good thing about fund balance and capital also is those are things that can carry over. You know, fund balance, if, if we have a delay in getting the materials in, that fund balance amount is available. I mean, at some point we could commit that so that it's it's more stringent on what we're using it for and the capital can roll over from year to year too. So anything in those columns would be, you know, I'd be comfortable if things slip. We'd have to definitely be looking at the ESSER 3 to make sure that we can hit the timelines for that. And I'm sorry, I missed the 18th because I was away, but um, so I'm sure you talked about, I just wondered about the bus lane. Like, is that is that involving the city? Like, does that- Yeah, so I actually met with the city, um, Corey Beeline, the jazz singer. Um, I met, he's a city engineer, city planner <coughs> on last week. And we actually watched the 
the buses go. They're actually planning on, on redoing the sidewalks on the other side of the street. Okay. Um, the idea of a, and he's still thinking and we're still thinking, the idea of a big move is probably not going to offer the rewards as doing lots of smaller things like okay. widening the street a little bit, lowering some of the curbs such that if a bus gets trapped like it does with traffic, at least they can go over the curb and, and get moving on versus someone okay. having to direct traffic. So I think there's going to be a lot of those little things that are going to give us a pretty big bang for our buck. And if it doesn't work, we'll go to the, the next thing. But uh, we are working with the city on that. And they are planning to do more work on, on that street next summer. So. Thank you. Can I ask a question about the track, just to make sure I'm clear on the cost? Um, the limited scope is 1.5 million. The expanded, you have 860,000. Is that plus? Yes, on top okay. of that initial. So the, the idea that 50. the sort of base scope would be, we dig it up, we put base down, it gets paved, it gets, it gets an athletic surface on it. Mm -hmm. We put up some sort of pole barn because we want to stop. We won't drive on that anymore. Yep. So we'll have to take that storage and put it somewhere else. So that's sort of the base one. And then again, that next piece is do we put in pole vaulting pits? Do we put in more press boxes? Does that mean we have to move the baseball field? All those kind of things. And um, so that's that's a that's a wild one. That's a more that's a wild one. And that one point five million would come from the fund balance as currently projected, and the additions would be cobbled together from other sources. Or, yeah, so we're, we're hoping for the infrastructure bill, right. uh, depending on how much that is and how much we get from that. Our pole, pole would, vaulting stands infrastructure. What? Our pole vaulting stands yeah. infrastructure. <laughs> yes, it, okay. yeah. Or from other, other sources that may eventually come in or well, that it doesn't get used in other areas or because these are such rough estimates, we're not, not positive on that. And that was a, a question he actually had was how, uh, and I know that both of you tend to be conservative on your estimates. How um, how confident are you in, in some of these numbers? I, I think if you gave if you gave me two hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars, I could make a, we could make a heck of a nice new a heck of a nice um, supportive special ed space at Union Elementary. If you gave me fifty thousand, we could make it much better than it is right now. If you gave me a million, we could make it. Beyond what we needed. <laughs> so these numbers, as you, if you look at any one, and every cost estimate will be the same. And uh, you know, if you look at one number, it's wrong. They're all wrong, but together they're not as wrong as they are individually. So <laughs> again, you 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 give me one point six million dollars, we can address all this. If you gave me two million to do the cafeteria and kitchen at at Main Street Middle, it'd be unbelievable. But you know what? Let me give me 175. We'll make it better. The, the good yeah. thing about the track is there's been there have been a lot of tracks that have been built in recent times. So we we know that the numbers have been on a one 1.2 million for just that track. So that number is not going to be too far off unless something is going well, on with some of the materials supply chain, but. But it's but it's it's a time game, right? So U uh, U thirty two did their track two years ago, three years ago. It was a, it was close to nine hundred thousand yeah, dollars. So it was pretty new. Yeah. yeah, three years ago about. Well, um, it was a little farther than that. Four years ago. Yeah. And it was about nine hundred thousand dollars. Well, you throw ten percent on top of that, you're up to one point three pretty darn quick. And we we throw another ten percent each year for the next two years. You're, you're we'll get there. We'll get there. And that's the that's the kind of project you, you you have to balance that. Let's get it done quick. Well, you're the, you're the if you wanted to build it next summer, you're the last bid of the season. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we take our time, we can bid it between beer season and, and New Year's next year, and you're the first one that they're bidding on the project. So they're gonna, you know, we'll be their first project, not their last project. Mm -hmm. And that's where you want to be. And so it's it's kind of a balance. You put, does inflation outweigh that being the first bidder? When it's all said and done, Grant will send a spreadsheet and it'll be exactly how much it costs. <laughs>
as long as you get those bids out when everyone's chopping wood. That's how you <laughs> get it. That's the <laughs> but no. But they're relative. They're, the, the good thing is they're relative. Like they're, okay, this project is more expensive than this one probably. And, and we haven't gotten that far. We haven't gotten that far. Oh. So yeah, the track expense was, got a little lump in my throat. <laughs> Just, it's a lot. Um, 2.3-ish million dollars, which when I added up all the totals at the bottom from the four columns, it's about 6.6 .6 million. So if I'm doing my math right, the track expenses make up about 36% of the total. Am I on, am I on track with that? <laughs> that sounds reasonable. Yeah. About right. So that seems a little high. Um, it just makes me sort of wonder about, I, I, I'm supportive of, um, of getting better facilities, uh, sports facilities in the district. And especially, uh, you know, I have kids who play sports and I have seen, I've traveled around and seen the other facilities locally at other schools. So when I do the visual comparison, I'm like, we, we deserve a little better and I, and I would like to do that. So I'm definitely supportive of that. Um, but it, it makes me sort of question um, the values calculation of like, what are we valuing? Um, over other things, so that it did, um, it did raise a question in my mind about is you know is it worth thirty six percent of this total budget to get a better track? And I don't know if um, if you can just sort of speak to you know the values part of it, like what you were weighing this against other things. I, I can't speak to that. I I will tell you that I mean. You can scale down or scale up certain things, but a track you can't. If you want it on the list, it's going to be this. If you don't want it on the list, it's going to be zero. Mm -hmm. It's it's either all or nothing when it comes to that. Um, unfortunately, it's a big ticket item. Mm -hmm. Now, we did at least break it apart. And that 860 and the other infrastructure, I mean, that would be certainly a lower priority. But if we want to do kind of just the track and just a whole barn to be able to get some, some storage, that's... I mean, that's the price of it. Um, so other than, I mean, these other ones, you could try to make them bigger projects and increase the price, mm -hmm. or you could just take that one off. But what you can't do is you can't reduce it. You that's can't like go problem. halfway. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just prior to this, was a good example of this. They put all of their endowment into um, providing for expanded educational opportunities and they have really poor athletic facilities as a result. It, you know, right. whereas other whereas other colleges don't provide, don't don't place as much of a premium on that and they have amazing athletic facilities. Right. So I really think that this is like, you know, this this value question is a good question for the board to be considering with the administration. I, I really value that question as well. I will say that that is the primary reason why it's in the fund balance column, why I thought it made more yeah. sense to be there, because I certainly don't want to be using ESSER 3 money and say we're using 90% of our ESSER 3 money yeah. on track at one school. Right. Um, that's why I thought if we do the fund balance, that's money that's already in the bank for us. So it would maybe take some of the sting out of it if people are kind of comparing and contrasting. But once again, this is all just basically putting thoughts on paper based yeah. on the requirements that we've heard from the community and from internal. Joel? Yeah, well, and I, I had that same sort of reaction, but I, it, it strikes me, this is just projects and infrastructure, right? So as like an overall yeah. comparison, like this doesn't include like our academics or our special education. I mean, that's, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know what our like annual budget is. About 25 million. 25 million? Yeah. It's in our fourth quarter, or our fourth quarter. Oh, <laughs> 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 finance committee comes out strong. <laughs> 20, 26 million dollars is the same. Okay, that makes me feel better because I, I have that same kind of, yeah. Yeah. Special education is about four million. Thank you. Um, I had a couple other questions unless I can. Yeah, no, go for it. Other I, people go first. Is that the question? Yeah, that was it. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. Um, I was wondering, um, the windows, it looks like the windows have been moved out of ESSER 3 and originally 
they had been proposed to be in SR30. Can you talk about that decision? Yeah, and this is the feedback of the team that we got. And so and then we, after talking about it and hearing the feedback around that, we said it's already in the capital plan. It goes back to what Jill was saying around shortage and chances are we can't do it quickly, you know, right. which is what we were thinking about with our professor. It's, we had planned on doing it across seven years. Like that's, so we just said, let's just move it back there. Yeah. Okay. Um, was, yeah, I was going to do the same thing. Doing yeah. the windows out of ESSER allowed us to do these spaces with, yep. with yeah. the capital fund. Now we just change the name over the, over the column. Right. Yeah. And it makes more sense. It's more aligned with yeah. ESSER, the values of ESSER. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the, tra the transition room at the high school also gave me a tiny bit of sticker shock, and I just wanted to hear more about the scope of that project and why it's yeah, 375. It's, uh, it's for kids who um, are transitioning out of our high school and into the world that need a lot of life skills. So what it is is basically creating an apartment within Montpelier High School. So it would have a kitchen, it'd have a bathroom, it, you know, it'd have places where we can teach transition skills, life skills, um, where we can teach cooking with, the, with kids who will be making their own meals eventually around a hot surface that typically have had an adult right next to them doing yeah. that their whole lives. Um, and it just, it's a lot of work to make the space that it currently is into some, it's, you know, plumbing, it's electric, it's a lot of things behind the walls that we'd have to do. Um, and, above the ceilings. and above the ceilings to make it work in yeah. the way that we really want it to work for kids who need that type of instruction. Mm -hmm. So I it's, it's for a very high needs population. I remember the description of like how the space would be used. I'm just sort of more curious because like the cafeteria and the kitchen project at MSMS is, you know, roughly the same amount. And so I'm just curious, like why absolutely you know absolutely and, and that's and that is that is a that is a big number and again the idea is where are we going to put it we don't know yet yeah if we build it it doesn't want to be it doesn't want to be falling apart in five years it's going to be a hard to use space so it's going to be tiled it's going to it's not going to be it's going to be a well-built space it's going to serve the population and then once you start putting kitchens into things you start dealing with kind of so that number is probably probably maybe a little bit high the good thing about Union, uh, the Main Street Middle School kitchen, is a lot of the appliances we have over there are usable. So that's going to be a lot of finishes and retweaking some things. So um, it, it, that exactly speaks to the sort of individually, eh, as a group, you know, okay. it'll it'll shift in terms. I just didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to give the impression that that was just going to be, we're just going to stick a fiberglass shower in the corner and and a sink in the corner and, and call it done. I don't yeah. think that's the kind of we want it to And we don't know, good. you know, are we going to put laundry facilities into it? Are we going to, you know, it just hasn't evolved yet. It's building a little, yeah. building an apartment. So, but but I, I agree that, that that number probably is, probably is a little bit high. And, and as we get direction, yeah. don't, try, well, I shouldn't say that, but, <laughs> you know, the, the numbers, <clears throat> You know, that value judgment based on the numbers. I mean, they're all good projects. They're all yeah. going to be great for the students, and we'll we'll make it work. We can have, you know, as, as a colleague of mine used to say, you can have anything you want. You can't have everything you want. Yeah. You know? So, <laughs> we'll, we'll as it goes through, we may have to say we may have to, we will be back here at some point saying, we've done the work. You've said you want this project. It's a, something's got to give. We can reduce the quality yeah. of some things, or we can take something off the table. Yep. Yeah. My gut on that one in particular is just that the cafeteria space at MSMS is so important and it's so highly used that there's like what? But it's a big open space. Roughly 400 kids in there. So I would, just in my gut, I just would want to make sure that that one is like really well done. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so there's another question, just based on community feedback, I had a listening session at the Main Street Middle School Community Alliance um, a little over a week ago. And some of the feedback we received was about the cafeteria and kitchen space. And I was just wondering if these were in your mind in, as part of this renovation. They talked about wanting a water fountain and a hand washing station in the cafeteria. And I wondered, was wondering if that was in that scope of that project. We haven't gotten there yet, but that's that something we've, detail, we've heard yeah. of in other, but that's a, I mean, that's a new priority in, in cafeterias is actually having a hand washing station. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have at Union, I know they want to do one down at Roxbury, yeah. so yeah. And just coincidentally, I was reading, I think it was our wellness policy, 
And I was like, oh, it's actually our policy to have water for kids available at, in the cafeteria. I didn't realize that. And um, anyway, yeah, so yeah, it yeah, seems no, like absolutely. it was. Um, yeah, my only other like feedback, just based on the community feedback we received around ESSER would be, it looks like we can go up to 1.7 million, almost 1.8 for ESSER, and I would just say, you know, potentially to consider going even under that a little bit and, and leave more money for learning loss, which is what um, the feedback that we received during the, the initial ESSER feedback. So that would be one of my suggestions. Thanks for doing that, Emma. I didn't realize there wasn't. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> there's not a there's drink, there's not a water fountain, I guess. Oh, no, the, yeah, there's one out there's the, 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 the corridor leading to it. But. Right, so kids have to like leave or, or and they're not. I don't. Know. Yeah, it's yeah, just no, no, that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Our, and, and you know, I apologize if I missed this during this conversation. Um, the three items that were eliminated here. That are struck out. What is the reason behind that? We talked about it earlier. Okay. Thank you. You're gonna have to review the. Tape I'm, I'm very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long week already. You were looking for the budget for Jill. <laughs> that might have been it. <laughs> Brett. Oh, what is the sustainability lab? It wasn't yeah. in the presentation from August. Did you already see that? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So the sustain. So if you you can go see it. So we um are. Family consumer science teacher retired last year, and with, in conversation with the kids at MSMS, they wanted to design more of a sustainability um, course for all students to take. And the students designed it themselves. You can see their presentation from the summer, the yeah. the summer. June, maybe the next one. Um, May or June. <laughs> Um, and Don Taylor moved over from humanities. He was a humanities teacher and he's taken that on <coughs> with gusto. Um, and so they've, they're focusing in on just the whole uh, sustainability, the standards for sustainability, global standards for sustainability. And it's, it's, he's doing a magnificent job. So Andrew and I went to go talk to him and said, he's in the family consumer science space right now, um, which is, if you, where to see it, it's an old space. <laughs> it's what you would imagine it to look like. And uh, we said, dream big, what do you want it to look like? And so he gave us all kinds of ideas. So this is based off of Don's thinking about the work that the kids have told him they want to do. You say it was based on what standards? The global, I'm not using the right term. It's the global sustainability standards. But if you look, I can get you the, if you send me an email to remind me, I can find out, remember what, board meeting that was. I remember it was warm, so it was either May or June. Um, but you can see the presentation that the students did with Don, okay. which was really great. Yeah, okay. I'll just look through. Too. I'd rather look and find it because okay. that actually show me other things. So. <laughs> yeah, maybe you flip through the agendas. You can identify the meeting and then. Okay. I'm going to, I'm printing an extra copy. This is the presentation that Andrew did on the 18th. Yeah, and, I'm looking at it. And if, oh, so on Actually, on the MSMS Family Consumer Science, there's a link to the student's sustainability presentation. Oh, there you go, Grant. Good. Good man to have on. Other questions for Grant and Andrew? Well, thank you. This is really exciting stuff. I, um, these are both needed and I think very forward thinking projects. So, um, we'll start to clear them as we move forward to the budget process. Emma. I'm just wondering the next thing on our agenda is community responses to budget conversations. And a couple of the things relate to like infrastructure projects. So, I was just wondering if you guys might be able to spare another few minutes to just hear that feedback. Is that what, am I right about that that's what we're talking about next? I think that's exactly it. Um, and also just kind of where we're, we're at with further outreach too. Okay. Do you want to? Sure. I mean, so just I had this listening session with Main Street Middle School, so it was mostly Main Street Middle School parents, and just a couple of other things. What was interesting, and actually, I started looking at the 
results, Amanda had shared a Google form with us to fill out for like any time that we had any community listening sessions. And so I was noticing, I mean, I'll, I'll give you the, the specifics of the feedback I received, but I was noticing like a lot of the things were pretty simple asks. And I was just hoping that they would be on your radar for like to try to quickly address some of these things. So one of the things was, um, and hopefully in this budget cycle, one of the things was like triple exclamation point more bike racks. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I was feeling, I was like, I feel like these are attainable goals, <laughs> which is so nice these days. Um, but it was like at all the schools they said across the board. I mean, I don't know. I definitely have noticed the mainstream middle school bike racks are really overloaded. A lot of kids ride bikes to school at mainstream middle school. So kids are trying to. <laughs> So that was one. Um, I mean, the drinking fountain and hand washing station was another. Um, the other thing, this isn't low hanging fruit. I think it's a complicated conversation, but I know that it's been coming up for at least four years because I heard about it a long time ago is field trips. And I know that these have been put on hold. Yeah. And so I wasn't at the school board level of the discussion, but I did hear about it in the community about field trips create this equity issue. Um, there's a couple of like sort of, I don't know, uh, capstone experiences at the middle school that relate to the curriculum. There's a fifth grade field trip to Boston and there's an eighth grade field trip to, I think it's Quebec City or Montreal, I forget. Quebec. Um, and Quebec. the question is, can those, those field trips, I mean, there's some that I can think of in the elementary school too that are just, they do them every year. And can some of those bigger field trips be folded into the budget so that it doesn't create these fundraising issues and put that burden onto families? And I've heard rumors and I don't, I don't know about it firsthand of some kids actually not being able to go because of not being able to fundraise the right amount of money. Um, so where do we stand on the potential of putting field trips? We can find the board meeting that we had okay. a long conversation about it a year and a half ago. Yeah. It was before COVID. Okay. Um because we were in person. So it was before COVID. It was before me. So yeah. I was and uh right we did some some rough math. And the quick answer is we can do that. It depends on how much you want to and how much the board would like to increase the tax rate to do that. Or would you like to get rid of a teacher to do that? So it's it's a it's a considerable amount of money. And then the other question to grapple with, and we never finished the conversation. We'll put that, I don't remember ever finishing the conversation because the numbers were so large. The other part of it was the board would need to make some sort of policy or direction to the administration around which field trips count and which don't in that. Um, so so it was it's a more complicated conversation. Yeah. Um, that we could cert the board's certainly welcome to bring it back, but you're talking about massive dollars that equal teaching positions. Okay. Yeah, and my understanding too is that you know, um, kids from families that are unable to bear those costs are not punished. Right. As a result, they we figure that out. That things are figured out to make the kids. Happy. So that is your feeling. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's Gotham. Yeah. Okay. There are other, I will say, not to open a camera, I think the but question there are other ask, like, What about people can't afford it? And the answer is, well, if I can't go, I think that's where it comes from. But that's mm -hmm. what figured out. There are some other equity issues that I'm discussing with the teachers now around mm -hmm. it, but it's a completely different, it doesn't have to do with cost. Okay. Yeah, um, before I was on the board, I was a parent who came to the school board to talk about, <laughs> okay. that was about fundraising which was connected it, it was connected. a fundraising yeah. event that was tied to that, the yeah. boston trip that felt very sort of punitive and kids were running out at the roundabout to try to like get people you know it, it yeah. came a little bit out of control and i think that was a lesson but i, I share the concern or i think it'd be great in the future when we can think about travel and traveling in groups like that it's yeah. kind of neat to have that conversation of what we could and what couldn't because i think you know, it can't be everything, but if yeah. there's a way to have like one, like the Boston or something that is part of the curriculum that's an equitable trip, maybe there's another way we can fundraise that doesn't sort of shame kids who don't have neighbors to ask and parents to yeah. ask. So okay. I agree. And it's something we had discussed at the time, I don't know. 
that there was having some kind of like sliding scale. And there's there's two, I, I guess, issues related to that. One is, you know, we, we do need to be, I remember two issues that came up. One is, you know, we need to be cautious about <clears throat> stigma when it comes to assisting families and students. Um, at the same time, you know, because we don't, qual well, I don't know where Green Reduced Lunch is now. At that time, we didn't qualify for Green Reduced Lunch for everybody, so we did have some students that still were, you know, it, we're not a, one of those districts that, that has that, that's above the threshold, the number of students being above a certain threshold, I think it's like 40% that are on Green Reduced right. Lunch, where you can offer it to everyone. Yeah. So we did have some of those situations. We do have those situations in our district, or did at that time. And so there was consideration as to like, you know, using some of our existing um, assistance thresholds to provide assistance to families for those types of opportunities. But I just remember those, those were a couple ideas that were thrown out there because of, we were looking at a, a large amount of money. Okay. It's certainly a bigger conversation than yeah. yeah. It's, it's one I think yeah. we should think about some different things too. And especially <laughs> okay. with Someday. Joe Chico Matic again. Someday. Yeah. <laughs> I will tell you one thing that just a statement of fact is since I've been here, I have never reduced a principal's submission when it related to field trip supplies, field trip transportation. So, I mean, it's not like something has come to the bigger group of administrators and we've crossed something off the list. But I do think it's a bigger question because of some of the types of field trips and the scope and size of some of these things. Um, my rule of thumb is if it's an important field trip and you need to do it, then put it in your budget. But it makes you have to think about things like an Ireland trip or a, or a Boston trip or a Montreal trip or whatever. Those are just big things. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of money, but more important than that from my perspective, it's a lot of time out of the classroom too but you're absolutely right it's a bigger conversation but it's not necessarily something that's due to us putting limits on people submitting budgets okay. to serve them. um i'll just like quickly go through the other things there was like food uh food was brought up improving nutrition um offering more positions surrounding nutrition, which I know we're having a struggle to fill anyway. I'll do it. <laughs> um, literacy was a topic of discussion, um, especially kids on IEPs. And that sort of, to me, that sort of triggered back to this um, conversation that we had had around ESSER, um, but it was in particular around literacy and learning loss around COVID. So we had um, talked to that person and said maybe consider, we, we can consider that as part of ESSER, but um, I don't think that's it. There's a couple other things that have just sort of come on my radar um, over the course of the last couple of years. But one of them was that I've talked to Libby and Jim about was um, graduation budgets at the schools. And I've been on some of the graduation committees and it feels like it's a little bit of a shoestring budget. <laughs> and it feels like maybe even just like 2000 more dollars would be really helpful for each of the schools to help plan those ceremonies. Um, I'm smiling behind my mask because in the draft budget worksheets that I sent out, I actually in increased the budgets for at specifically at Union and Main Street in that one specific line. And so in case you didn't think about adding it, let's increase this. Wonderful. Um, and there was also a, a big conversation at the middle school about like beautification projects, which aren't like infrastructure and, you know, windows and, and it's not like that important, but it, but it helps with morale and sort of creating a sense of belonging and space. And they were talking about it in terms of a huge mural project. And I, I noticed when I walked through the halls here that this school does a really great job with that. I love looking at the public art. I don't know. I know that often that kind of work ends up falling on the art teacher <laughs> to and provide those things, um, which maybe isn't equitable to that person. But um, I just wonder about potentially including some money in the budget for things that aren't that fall outside of the scope of like this is a, a need, an infrastructure need, and more of like a community building, like 
beautifying the space type of thing. Yeah, it's my understanding with the mural from Mike that he's working on other funding streams, grant mechanisms yes, to, to get that absolutely. action going. So, um, but you're right with the murals you see here that those have primarily been guided by the art teachers yeah. here. Um, and we've had some phenomenal ones here, yeah. you know, so, and then also with the, is it the harvest piece that they, um, that's one of the community projects each year with the harvest celebration, which is actually happening tomorrow, um, that kids do some sort of service around the school. Or am I mixing up my day? Uh, I can't remember. I, I'm not 100% sure. Because it hasn't happened in two years, which is why my brain's fuzzy as to when they do it. But that's another piece of it. It's usually yeah. like part, it's, it's a tradition here to do something yeah. like that. So I think it just and, might encourage that kind of stuff if there was a line item for it. Um, I know, you know, I've worked in a few different schools, and so you see some things where you're, it's like really stunningly beautiful, and I know that some of the Main Street Middle School parents, like three years ago, were talking about before the bathrooms were renovated, we were like, what can we do to help make these spaces friendly? And, and there was talk about like painting and doing stuff in there, and it would just, even if it's just small. Well, a couple of things. On the, uh, Mike yeah. is already, the last meeting I had with Mike Perry, uh, he was talking about exactly that, working with the art teacher and taking down some of the older uh, stuff out of the basement and opening that up for paintings and things like that, and as well as the mural that's above the, the main doors and possibly doing something there. So Mike is already working with the, yeah. the people on that. If anybody is, you guys haven't had a chance, but on a night like tonight, you might want to swing by the, the Franklin Street exit, Franklin Street entrance to Main Street Middle. We redid that store stairwell, new paint, new lighting. It looks really cool. And so we're trying to elevate that. And hopefully you guys will well, you guys will be able to get there and see the new gym. So we're 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 working on it over there. Yeah. So you got anybody who hasn't who hasn't been in that gym since a couple of years and remember the brown paint and the crummy insulation, all that would be blown away. It's gone from a dingy old multi purpose room to a proper gym. The so. sloughing insulation. Oh the sloughing. Do you have that do you have that? The picture. That picture? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're looking for? Of course, Andrew. <laughs> no more sloughing insulation. No, that was all taken out. It's all been painted, and Libby's looking for a little image that I sent that um, is kind of cool. Um, yeah, I think those are that's great, and it's and it definitely makes a difference. I do think there's a slight difference between like brand new beautiful facilities and art. You know, like beautifying a space through yep. something artistic. And a lot of those, I mean, those could be just some good ideas that the principal has about spending money that could just qualify as a supply type of yeah. purchase. Yeah. And if a principal has a requirement like that, by all means, they, they can increase their supply line under the principal's budget. And just tell me why, you know, as long as it's not a huge increase, then I'm sure we could accommodate it. And if it is a large increase, we might be able to accommodate that too, as yeah. long as we can, as long as I can explain to everybody why or what it's yeah. doing. So I would, when a, when something like that comes to me, I always say, well, put it in your budget. Let's see how it goes. Let's yeah. see if, if we can afford it. And just make sure if it's a big increase that you explain it so that I can advocate for it yeah. when we get there. So certainly that would be a feedback back to people is, you know, have, have your principal included in the budget. And, you know, let's, we'll see. Yeah. Can you think of some examples in schools like around the state, Emma, that of what you're talking about? So. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, there's examples right here in the school where you, when you walk down the hallway towards the cafeteria, there's a like huge the mural room. there. Yeah. And like those beautiful new portraits that are, yeah. that are hung right outside of, um, of the like front office are really cool. There's been some sculpture work at the entrances of schools that I've been to where, you know, and a lot of it is like sort of student driven and it doesn't cost a lot. But I know that also sometimes it, it fall, ends up falling on, you know, like I think the type of thing that you're talking about, it, it then if it's not a line item where it's not like, hey, we want to offer you money to beautify the space, then it might not even come on to the radar of the of administrators to think to ask for that. And oftentimes it ends up what the experience that I've seen is it ends up falling mostly on art teachers to work with their students mm -hmm. to provide something for the school. Um, there's another one, there's a big uh, mural at Danville where it's all recycled materials and they took, and it was the art teacher, <laughs> and, but they worked with other teachers and the cafeteria staff 
to take all the cyclables and make made this like huge beautiful mural that looks like mountainscapes and sunsets with like caps and recycled mostly caps bottle caps and jar caps so are you suggesting principals like look for professional artists work to put in their well schools? that was the conversation that was ha being had by the main street middle school community alliance is they were talking about bringing an outside artist artist in residency to come in and like libby said i mean the idea was to tap into a bunch of different funding sources for that but in my mind i didn't say it out loud during the meeting but in my mind i was like i wonder if the school if if we could pitch in a little bit towards that as well and that they wouldn't have to i mean the ticket price was pretty high on that particular artist in residency program so i don't know if it would have to be like that amount of money <laughs> but um but even a little every little bit helps with stuff with something like that and it's like they were talking about it as like a community building project a morale building project and something that would really leave a mark um, part of it was even designed to be on the outside of the building and so it could tap into city um, art grant public art grant funds so it's just something i wanted to like put on the radar yeah yeah the, the challenge a lot of times is that we don't hear about these things yeah. you know, as the budget's being built. So you, certainly, I think it's great to remind people to think about those kinds of projects when they're building a budget as well. Yeah. All right, excellent. Um, thank you, again, very helpful. Um, and we'll get back to you for the evening. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. What are you gonna do? Did you want to talk about volunteering? Yeah, I yes, yes, absolutely. Um, let's do that now. Then we can talk about the RFP and yeah. making process. Do you want to? I can embarrass maybe? Andrew first. Publicly thank Andrew for all the extra yes. gigs he's doing right now. This man is amazing. And he Twenty-five, right? <laughs> Thirty. <laughs> so, it's a, 25th anniversary. The people in this room are really stepping up big time. And Andrew's leading the charge on a lot of that. So thanks, Andrew. Do you want me to say what I know? Is that yeah, helpful? You know, okay, you <laughs> He's like, enough of this. Stop it. <laughs> I was going to sing happy birthday, but. Oh, that yeah, was that's what I was going to say. So at our last board meeting, um, and, and just, you know, sort of out in the public knowledge that the school is really trying to recruit folks for a lot of positions um, in the department, including um, custodial help and help in the, in the cafeterias and so on. So um, some of us were trying to figure out how we could possibly lend a hand in the short term until uh, the schools are fully staffed or if there's something else that we can do to help. We know we have a lot of um, folks here who really want to help and many hands make light work and we're trying to help. I know it's only October and I know nationwide schools are really school employees are really struggling and feeling the pressure and Montpelier is not immune to that so it's um so some of us have some of the board members have offered i know emma's helped with testing um anna kit and i have started um working at the elementary school to do cleaning it's very straightforward and it's just something little that if folks have a little bit of time to dedicate um that it's helpful but we also need to sort of be um thoughtful about it and not overload everyone or not create a lot of extra work for the staff. Um, so uh, this week we, is the first week we've done this and, and the need seems to be largely at the elementary school for the uh, sort of after school shift. It's a two, at two to two and a half hour shift. Um, my husband, Jesse and I did that Monday night. It was really straightforward. Tara and Deb at the school were fantastic and showed us how it's done. It's kind of rewarding in a way. It feels like it's something little you can do. You know, you're cleaning down little sweet little first graders chairs and desks and vacuuming and Jesse knows his way around all the bathrooms now. <laughs> so I'm happy to be kind of a, a funnel for volunteers. So, and then I would work directly with Andrew because we wanna make sure it's helpful and not bombard Libby or Andrew with emails and volunteers and trying to coordinate in people's schedules. So I'm happy to do that. It sounds like we have this week covered, but we might, um, we might set up sort of a more Sort of ongoing schedule maybe two weeks at a time so people can you know we're not overlooking you know overworking the same few folks but we're you know spreading the load are, are you thinking about doing some outreach on that too to like 
I know I know there are a number of parents like in my neighborhood like the, that, the that's heard and, of this that yeah. have been like, I, I could dedicate some time. To yeah, this. so there's lots of folks who want to help. Um, there would be some requirements for doing some sort of the um, background check. The background check which we could help point them towards Tracy in the in the office here. Um, but that's sort of why I would like one of us or a couple of us board members to be that funnel. So I've already reached out to two of the parents groups and um, they're like eager to help. But we don't want 30 people, right? Because then it's like there's too much training and so on. So if we can get like a good core group of teams of two to cover it until, um, you know, things change. So that was kind of the thinking is that after this meeting, if I got the boards okay and it was helpful for – um, for Libby and Andrew that that I could reach out to the three parent group heads and they could help me, but then I would still sort of funnel volunteers, let them know how to get the background check. Because they're really serious. A lot of them sort of say, yeah, I want to help. But then when you actually look, like for example, this week I was like, oh, I can do, I could do every night. No, I couldn't do every night, right? So um, we want to make it be realistic. Well, and the good news is we're talking, I don't even know if you know this yet, <laughs> is that we, Hired somebody today. Oh, yeah. Hired a somebody today. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Thank you for that person. <laughs> right, right. And Tom has even worked with it before. Okay. Um, yeah, Tom's working on So, so if I can speak to this one, this is yeah, please, yeah. so we've got a couple of uh, folks who are off for for uh, different reasons who will be coming back into the mix, presumably, possibly. In a couple of weeks, so this this is sort of initially it's kind of a short term window. So Tara and Mickey and Tom, as well as the rest of the crew, are quite remarkable, and, and you guys have no idea how lucky you are to have them. Uh, Tara is probably putting in twelve hours today for us, maybe fourteen, and then she's going to go to another job, else. and she does that six days a week, and she doesn't complain, and she does a better job than the three of them have. So this is kind of a, initially, this is, I think if we can kind of address the next couple of weeks, maybe even in our minds, think to Thanksgiving, because we think we hire someone that's going to take a little while to get them up to speed and all that. Um, I think if we have a small group, whether it's you folks and a few, you know, I've, I've got the same phone calls and there's some people that I know, you know colleagues of, of people who actually designed the bathrooms at that school that I go, yeah, they'll, they'll go in there and they'll complain about who built it, but, you know. <laughs> but I, so I think that that keeping as a small group, uh, Tara is happy to go in and train. And it's really, as Jill said, it's not particularly complicated. It's just that four hours, uh, four and five hours of, of, of sort of just work allows the custodians to do the, the, the sort of more technical work. Uh, and, and the lightning core is great to do that with. Um, so if, it, if it's okay, I think Jill would be a great conduit for sort of the school board and those volunteers. She and I can work together and I'll back Phil on our end, you know, when, when there's a gap. You know, Deborah's been over there last night, a couple nights. Pam's been over there. I've been over there. You know, we're able to back Phil with our own with our own folks. So if that seems like a system, I think that that would work well. If it doesn't overwhelm overwhelm you, um, I think that would be a good way of doing it. We very much appreciate it. Our custodians are working their behinds off right now, and and that's not what how we want to treat our employees either. You know, with Tara working that much and Mickey working that much, and they both have small children, so and John too. So we want to make sure that it's it's helpful, even if we can get them one less hour, <laughs> right, or one hour back to themselves during the day. Um, these are really good people, and we want to make sure they stick around. So. Did, did we, I 100% agree um, and support that. Um, do we ever, um, have we been, I know some teachers do this, and I'm pretty certain some teachers in this district do this, and there was an op-ed that I think you shared this past week, Jill, about asking students, at least for their spaces, to like mm -hmm. clean up after they're done, to like help pitch in uh, at an individual kind of classroom level. Is that something that we're doing at all or have we considered yeah this is the this is the stuff that you don't have kids do yeah. you know so yeah, that's what i was we frown up on pretty gnarly kids, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm yeah. Suggesting that. I'm, i was wondering like to the extent that like we can ask kids to like make other the the lives and the work uh load of these mm -hmm. individuals lesser like we're a community yeah well, kids are great at cleaning up as volunteers what I tell the teachers when they ask, you know, what can we do? Can I, I'll be happy to clean all that. 
leave your room in a position that we can clean it. Yeah. That's that's yeah. the best. If everybody did that, and 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 the vast majority do, that's the key because it allows us to get in and do what we need to do. It's when it's when we can't. You know, it's, they're little kids. We understand. They're, they're little kids, and and it's funny. Jill knows. You know, you go into the kindergarten room and you know, it's like there's <laughs> there's animal crackers all over. By the fourth grade, it's nice and tidy, and, and you know, Grant would be proud. <laughs> um, so it's just an age thing, and, and we don't have any expectations of, of you know, little kids picking up graham crackers. But you know, so that's that's what we just ask of the teachers is at this point is leave it till we can clean it, and and that'll be ninety percent of it. That'll get us ninety percent of the way there. So. Yeah, I had wondered if um, if this was like the whole school year, if this might be a great like community service thing for high school students. Right, um, it does. It's very, it's very <laughs> humbling <laughs> to realize how much happens when we're not here. And I think COVID has proven that that's what an essential worker is. These are the people who do all the things so that we can show up and do all of our things. And it's it's a good reminder. Um, and I just want to say really quickly that I, I, um, I know that there's also another volunteer opportunity coming out. They'll be coming out from Libby for helping with the testing. That's a different setup. So I don't want people, if you can't help with evening cleanings at Union, there are lots of other opportunities. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate you helping coordinate this, Jill. It's, sure. it's super important. And um, I would just ask you the board for your support. And I would have no doubt that we'll give it to you as, as well as our teachers appreciation. Hugely, hugely important, and, and again, um, yeah, thank you both to you, but also thank you to all the custodians who are carrying a really heavy load right now. So I shared that document with you. This is the quick spreadsheet that just has the weeks and, and, and where they're okay. where they're at, and uh, some notes on different people and what was like. And it's it's been a rumor mill. Every you know, oh, so and so is going to do this, or so and so is going to do that. And, right. you, know, you were going to work all week, and November said, no, they're not, they're not coming tomorrow night. It's like, oh. Okay. So um, it'll be a good spot to kind of get our head around who's available when. So if anybody's interested in helping tomorrow night, we can use a hand. Um, so, but reach out to Jill. That's right. Yeah, people and in Anna, this room, reach out to Jill. I know is, is tomorrow night, Thursday night, right? Yeah. So yeah, you're coming, you're coming tomorrow night? Okay, I'll plan on being there as well. And Jesse and I would, but we have a field hockey. And conference. Friday. And then Monday. And that's, that's the perfect thing. You and Jill can talk about that. Yeah. Of, of, we'll let those. But okay, so five o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, what did you represent their evening voluntary at RBS? We, we're fortunate. John, um, one of our custodians, actually lives in Northfield. So it's very, and he does most of our outdoor stuff. So okay. now that the growing season is slowing down, he's able to go in there. Either, he'll either do it at night or do it before. Um, we will keep you informed. Yeah, um, I can do things in the evening in Roxbury. I can do things before 7 a.m. in Northfield. Yeah, and, and it's a huge it's it's a huge thing, even, and that's a great thing to know. If John doesn't have to go down, and that's the thing, he's we're now right. Yeah. If you if you were willing to go down and empty the trash cans or the sure. apples over the Absolutely. weekend, it's, yeah. that's three hours of John's time to I do a, a five minute task. I couldn't. I don't know. I could be closer, but it would be hard. I'm very close. Yeah. So. Appreciate it. We'll, we'll keep you in the. Tom has got a, Tom has Tom has been very conscious of Tom Allen and been very conscious of moving people to kind of get them. Because at high school, it's easier to do, but there's stuff like this that he he can't help with. This is Zach knows where all this stuff goes once he moves and he puts it all back together. So he, he's, he's moved people so that it's pretty much man power by the time it's all done. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. And if it gives you and Libby even 10 minutes of time to do something else, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> yeah, it was really eye-opening doing the testing. Um, just, I mean, it's my understanding that you were there that whole time doing yeah. that testing. So that's like a You gave me a whole day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I was just imagining how much can Libby get done if she's not here? Like, I, you know, it's really important to be freeing up the time. Our, our chief problem solver. Yeah, it's a lot of hours. <laughs> it is, yeah. Do you want to talk about testing health? Or, and thank uh, you very much, Emma, for, for doing that. That's yeah, it, it's, it's actually huge. It gives me back a whole day.
Um, I know. Which I was happy to do. I'm happy to do it because it's what needs to be done to keep our kids safe. Um, and it can be done. <laughs> I've, penciled, I've penciled in Mondays. And uh, I think there's a couple that I could do. So maybe. Yeah, there's, there's a go. couple that I'll, I'll step in on. And I, have, I think I have those on my calendar if I can make sure of it. So uh, because the other stressed group here are my nurses. Right, they're they're working very hard, especially when we have positive cases and when the state promises things, but they can't picture how it's going to happen right away. There's a little bit of a freak out time that we have to calm down, right? So um, I will be sending out a notice to the community around the test to stay and rapid testing uh, because we cannot do it without community volunteers. It just will not be able to happen until we get more kids able to be vaccinated. So um, that probably a fully vaccinated five-year-old probably won't happen until January 1st-ish. If You know, when we're talking fully vaccinated, two shots, two weeks after the second shot, um, we'll probably be around the first of the year. So we've got some time and with cases the way they are in Washington County right now, where we have to expect that there will be more quarantines in the next two months. So, um, I'm, we're, I'm doing all the back end work to get test to stay up and running when it's actually happening. Um, when we're actually testing, I will need a cadre of, of people in here to help with testing, the little ones in particular. So there is a note going out to the community, um, if not the end of this week, because I'm still kind of playing with a few of the logistics ideas in my head and then it will go out Monday or Tuesday. Um, and all that implies is, yes, I'm available on Mondays from 7.30 to 9.30. And if you call me on Sunday night, I can be there on Monday morning. Um, so it's, that you did make me think, Brett, that I need to add to that survey around uh, at least Roxbury or Montpelier. That would be easier. So Rhett, I showed some board members earlier the, the survey and that was some good feedback from Rhett too. So um, that's coming out soon. Um, we hope we can get it to work so we're quarantining less kids and keeping them from in school because i know emma knows from experience of that well it made me think that i mean i'm sure we'll figure out how to organize it but there was a time the union school probably some of you remember this um, had like class captains <laughs> and so we had like one or two parents per classroom that were in charge of like sort of activating, mobilizing the volunteer needs within that classroom. And I know that when your class is quarantined, there's at least two or three parents <laughs> that would be willing to come down for however many hours yeah, it would take it to, to, to get all those kids back in the classroom yeah. because it directly impacts you. And then you're at home with your kids. Yeah. So I, I know that when it happens, there's going to be the support for it. Yeah. And, and I think I think I figured out how to get the volunteers. Uh, the next stage is just logistically where in the buildings and what is it going to look like and what's the flow going to be. Um, and uh, quite honestly, keeping it off my nurses' plate because they will want to be there and they have other things to do from 7.30 to 9.30 in the morning. So, um, so it will be me with volunteers, possibly Andrew, because <laughs> he's my man that I go to and say, Andrew, I need this. <laughs> um, so so we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get it to work. It's not going to be up and running in the next week or two, but it will be up, running, up and running soon. So I think the state has figured out their supply chain issues, and so I think we're going to be able to give it a go. Wow. So people will be happy to hear that. Yeah. So that's the best way for that. Yeah, excellent. Um, it's available. Uh, the other thing we want to do is we, um, I think we made, uh, had a discussion, an executive session about suspending pulse monitor reports just because they're not required and we don't need to see them while Libby yes. does other things. So we yes. have a cupcake, right? Happy birthday. Yes, happy yes, birthday. go celebrate. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, my friend. Yes, happy birthday. Yeah. And there's, 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 there's my cell phone number there. Just because really good. Okay, I love it. I love it. I respect it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Me too. Happy birthday. Bye. Happy birthday. Go do a model. <laughs> I know. That's right. That's what you do. Yeah, I mean, the general 5,000 level yeah. view on this is at a, at a time of crisis and, and significant labor shortages 
we need Libby focused on all of these very urgent and time sensitive issues before us and any relief that we can provide, we want to. And while we certainly appreciate the policy monitoring reports and want those in the long run, for the foreseeable future, until we get through this period of crisis, the board, it is my understanding from our discussion that the board is, and, and I'll make a motion. Why don't I just make a motion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, based on our, our, our discussion of, of the state of affairs, I move that we suspend uh, policy monitoring reports um, for the time being. Do you have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And I do want to say, I do think it's a great practice in general, but sure. like there's a, yeah. you know. <laughs> I, I kind of feel bad that we didn't think to do this sooner. I mean, it just feels like, you know, your plate has been really over overflowing for a long time. And, um, I feel a little tone deaf for not recognizing that maybe that was something that we could have done. Yeah, I didn't tell you. <laughs> I didn't tell you either. I wouldn't worry about that. So. Um, great. Well, that will hopefully provide a little relief on you to solve all your problems. <laughs> the vaccines do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're coming soon. Um, so the next discussion is the RFP decision making process. Um, many thanks to Mia for who's on the line, who's on the, line uh, the Ricardo C number, uh, putting together. Uh, a really nice RFP that we we put out. Uh, yes. The the budget feedback piece. Can Kristen and I summarize some of the things? Oh yeah, can, sorry. And, or, that kind of got wrapped up. Um, we could provide it in another way. I don't need to. I think it's on. Did I read it on the spreadsheet, Amanda? We had today? we had. I think you're we had some about. conversations. Well, there are some individual specific conversations that we tried to document there, but there are also trends generally that might best be summarized. Um, yeah, go for, for it. Yes. Right now. Uh, I, yeah, sorry, I, um, I kind of got lost. Well, the there, are, there are sort of, there's, I mean, generally speaking in Roxbury, there are sort of three camps. There's a group of people that really, really, really advocates for outdoor education and, and all its forms. I'm not exactly sure all of its forms. That's one camp. Many of those folks actually don't send their kids to the school. And so I think it's in the interest of the school that that be a consideration generally. Um, although I know that there are strengths and weaknesses to that approach to education. I just think that that's important consideration. The second camp is really happy, good enough. The third camp doesn't understand why we're merged with Montpelier and thinks that this is the big city and their kids don't fit here. Um, and so to that camp, well, some people are like, let's stop kidding ourselves and stop sending kids to Montpelier. That's really not an option. What we can potentially do is make a, a really intentional effort to integrate the RVS kids with the Montpelier kids, not just in fourth grade, but throughout. And whether that means shared shared field trips, Zoom time, pen pals, I'm not sure. I think that that would benefit those kids to develop relationships with the kids that they're going to be in school with as starting at an earlier age. Um, and that's it, that's the summary. Great, that's super helpful. Uh, does anyone else wanna give any updates on I know Mia was trying to schedule the teen center, and that's on pause for now, just because of um, yeah. And um, I have had some contact with a couple of bullet bombs, and people are interested, but nothing has collapsed. Uh, and and I think people are are interested, but this is not going. Yeah, I mean, this has been an issue every year that I've been on the board. Is we Done. And I feel like things petered off a little bit, maybe last year, the year, I think last year around like the pandemic and just feeling we had so many board members. But in the past, when we've, we've reached out in a bunch of areas, a lot of people will say, thanks for reaching out, but we don't really have the time to talk to Peter. Yeah. So I, there probably are 
I'm interested to see. I really think the the like general package and approach that Amanda has put together is definitely the most promising, like general like outreach approach I've seen since being on the board. So hopefully that'll yield some and more. And I think Dr. Kristen Hansel. and Brett have, have provided have been yeah. a really great example of like if you build it, they will come. Like they're just going out and yeah. showing up. Yeah, they're hustling. Yeah, they're yeah. hustling. They're bustling. Um, the, the, it is, there is a lot of, um, what are you here for? Who are you? But yeah. that's important work to say, yeah. this is who we are and this is what we're here for. And if you don't talk to us, we cannot represent you. So having opportunities to do that, I think is important. Um, we even put on like an online survey. One of the things that happens with an online survey, you may get specific people to promote a specific point of view a great deal, um, like multiple responses to a single survey from a, a particular camp that feels very, very strongly about a specific, you know, perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, that may have been our experience in some ways, um, but definitely it's important to stand in front of the Roxbury Country Store and <laughs> say, hey, my name's Brett. Um, that's about the best place to find people in Roxbury. In case you're wondering if you want to meet people there, that's the place to do it. Excellent. Um, uh, I have a listening session scheduled here at the high school, um, October 28th for students. So it's geared towards students. And it's going to be during Solon Block. So it's one o'clock to 1.40 and the room is to be determined but October 28th, if any of you are interested in joining, um, uh, hopefully we'll get some students. <laughs> to, that's an area. What was the date again? Thursday. Thursday, October 28th, 1 o'clock to 1.40. It's um, during Solon Block. We're going to see what we can get. But the idea being that if we keep showing up, and being present that eventually people will come and talk to us. Um, Amanda and I also live in the same neighborhood. And so we put out an email, like a text to the sort of neighborhood <laughs> text thread and asked if they would want a listening session and they responded positively to that. And so we're gonna just do like a one hour Zoom listening session with just in our neighborhood. And so that's something that others could consider too. Excellent, thank you. Um, anything else on community outreach? So the RFP, uh, again, Hey, Jim. Okay. We've got a question. Oh, you hear me yet? Um, I was just on the community outreach. Has anyone wow. has anyone talked to um, the Pi folks about the fall festival and being there, other than Jim getting dunked in the dunking booth? <laughs> the, the fall festival yeah. with Pi on October 31st. The, the booth was open there. I could reach I could reach out to the organizers and see if we could have a table there. Yeah, you'd want to work out to or reach out to Adrian Gill. Yep. 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 It, it's not water, it's like no, it's Chuck E. Cheese balls. <laughs> Do you ever step in the ball yeah. pit at Chuck E. Cheese for your kids? Uh, no? <laughs> not, not, well, I, I'm sure I'm sure I did, but it was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the RFP now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We are talking about the RFP now. So, the main issue of the RFP, again, thanks to Mia for 
uh, put it together, put it out. Um, there were multiple people who asked questions. We only got one person who uh, actually submitted a proposal. Uh, that person is someone who has worked with the district before, who I think we all have a high level of trust in. Um, so I think the question is, do we want to try to go back out and be the Bushes again, or are we comfortable considering um, the just the one proposal we have? Because the, the deadline for submission was 13th? I think so, yeah. And uh, how, it was, it was open for a month, is that right? Yes. So it was open for a month and we only got one. What did we do, where did we post it, like Guy? What kind of outreach did you do on the last one? I know Mia sent it out to, a to some groups that's written in the RFP who she sent it out to. Um, others got it because people, some asked questions who we didn't send it to. So others got a hold of it. Um, and we posted on social. I will admit that we did not post it on the board's website because I couldn't figure out how to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's so it did fine. not go yeah. on our website, but we did do it. I did do it on social media. I mean, I will say, although don't get me wrong, the, the one proposal we got was very strong and very thorough, and we are familiar with his work, and he does great work. Um, I mean, there is a part of me that's like, wow, we only got one proposal for this, you know, like. I can say, I can speak to that because of the federal funding that's coming in, there's a lot of this type of work going on right. in school districts. I don't know about other other places, but in school districts, a lot of people are doing this. So, and there's a limited, number. to my knowledge, there's a limited number of people who have the skills to facilitate this level of conversation. Um, so I'm not sure who else, I don't, I have limited knowledge on this, but I'm not sure who else would get. Do, would we talk in public session about like the merits of this particular proposal or is that? It's a public proposal, right? right? Yeah, so yeah. I mean, there is like, and I, I'm very fond of Nathan um, and very glad that he, I, I share a community with him. There is an element of this that, you know, Nathan is, is like, it, it wouldn't be, he's not independent, right? He's a member of the Montpelier community. Yes. I don't know if that matters. I just think it's worth acknowledging. Emma? Well, just coincidentally, we happen to have policy EO2 on our agenda tonight. And in that policy, the budget ex execution policy, it talks specifically about like there needing to be a minimum of three bids. And then also on page two of the policy, I notice it says um, a conflict of interest arises if an employee officer agent or immediate family member, partner, or organization, right, offers. To, and then in that case, um, that we would have to have more than one bid. So I'm just wondering if it puts us in a position where we're out of compliance with our policy. I know Libby, you had mentioned that this was really more about construction, construction stuff, but. The second part, I'm not as positive, but the first part with the three bids. I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. EO2. Yeah. Which one are you on, EO2? Yeah, EO2, page two at the bottom, under four, conflict of interest. Um, I was reading through it earlier, so I'm trying to find the language. Um, EO2. I think that I is referring, yeah. that is not referring to the provider of right. the service, that's, provi that's referring to the selection and the handling of the funds. So like Libby couldn't select her husband to provide right. a, a service to the district. That's how I read that too. Yeah. yeah. So it's not the actual person doing the service. So yeah, the first line that says that may participate in selection of order administration to purchase or contract. But um, the, in general, the first line also says the purchase of supplies, equipment, and services represent. No, no, it's talking about that. So I was trying to find out where it says construction um, bids. 
so there so there's some things and maybe i'm just trying to get around it but because we have one bid and it's a good bid we like nathan but <laughs> um so one so one question I would have, and this is for the board to discuss, it's a board's policy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's your interpretation and this might be a loose interpretation when you're talking about district budget. Um, the question would be, is, is you're paying for this out of SR2 funds. Do we consider that part of the budget as it's meant to be here? That might be one question, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a separate, it's not something the voters have voted on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, when you're talking about any kind of bidding, that's a construction term, right? Because we didn't have them bid on it. We had we had them respond to it because we had the we have the amount that it, it would cost, right? But, but it's it's. I mean, it does allow for an RFP. A sole source RFP if or contract if the RFP only results in one bid. Where are you, Jim? So everybody under contract. Page two. Oh. Sole source contract should only occur when an RFP only results in a single bidder and then there's extra no bid. Yeah. Right. So, there, I mean, so that gives the board an out there. Yeah. yeah. The section that I was referring to is actually on page one at the very bottom. School board members, school district employees, or their immediate families may submit bids. However, bids submitted by those individuals may not be considered as part of the minimum number of required bids outlined above. Anytime such an individual is compelled to submit a bid, it must be in writing regardless of cost, can never be the only bid. So that, I mean, I just, once I started reading the language, I was just wish that we had more. <laughs> I just wish that we had more. I wish and we did too. <laughs> I, I also really appreciate Nathan and his work, and I think he did has done great work for us. He's already proved himself as, you know, qualified. Um, but it's a challenge to me reading this policy. Even outside of this policy, it's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, I just think it would be great if we could, um, maybe maybe we could take another two weeks to reach out to people again <laughs> i don't know i don't know how i know that we're already under such stress to find qualified people to do any work in our district so it's a struggle for me to even bring that up as an idea but well it's simple to send things out i don't know who to send it out to so yeah i need some help with yeah. that because the, the three people i know who do this work one did one turned it down and one asked questions but didn't fit so yeah, I could maybe together. help like do some research and I know some people like the, um, I know some people who do mediation work who have been professional facilitators through like mediation work. And so maybe we could at least just to get some more. Just to get context, right? Yeah, just to get more, more bids on the table. Mm -hmm. um, we could kind of think outside the box that's not maybe not consultant, well, but. Um, well, it also may help the boards um just being okay with it if if y'all sent it out to to more people yeah exactly or to more weeks and said we put a good effort in and we still haven't received anything back so yeah that that seems to make sense to me like take another two weeks push it out see what if anything we get um can you e libby can you email to us the link or whatever it is you have it on the board packet okay the rfp itself the rfp itself is in the same folder as nathan's proposal the folder la labeled rfp materials yeah <laughs> i i do think we have a strong proposal before us i just yes. think it would be helpful to yeah and also the stuff. language of this so i think you know well that was an excellent reading of the policy Emma. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Although, whoever wrote this, they, not on the policy committee. Yeah. <laughs> we need we need to amend this policy because yeah, a family member, not a whole family. If you read this, if you actually read this, a whole family needs to submit a bid for it not to count. Where are you looking at? 
<laughs> school board members, school district employees, or their immediate families, plural. I submit this. Um, <laughs> this is getting grammar, grammar police on us. <laughs> He's being well, a lawyer right maybe. now. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's totally bringing out the lawyer. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did not have an entire family of a district employee. We just did a you know, family member. Not a family. Yeah, and frankly, we we for this we wanted to get it moving for Sorry, audit purposes, but maybe I don't know I don't know how the policy committee feels if you, or the finance committee could assist with some of this too. I wonder if we should go back and I wonder if we should send it back and scrutinize it further, just like to what extent. Right now, I'm of two minds of that. The first mind is aren't we, we're doing this for ESSER funds? I don't know where Libby's at with applying for ESSER funds. But these, are, these funds have already been applied for and approved. Yeah, this is yeah. ESSER too. Yeah. I but mean, this is to get us to comply with 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 state and federal law sooner rather than later. Exactly. Essentially. Grant was this asking that we re oh, revise this policy when we're starting to spend ESSER money. Right. So right. that was the timely nature of this policy being revised now. Well, it's still being read, right? Why don't we just make that correction? We can okay. make that correction. Great. Yeah. And then we could um, <laughs> the families one. Yeah. We can always go back. And we can always go back to it. Family yeah. members. But I think for time necessity's sake, we kind of need it to move it forward and to yeah. address grants. Well, that's, that's just we can make this particular correction. And that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about more like I think Andrew was just was talking about going back and doing a deeper dive. I was sorry. asking. Yeah, I was asking. Yeah. yeah, I I think I I I. I appreciate both of your intuitions on this. I think you're right. Let's keep moving forward. Let's make this change now and keep moving forward. Hey, Jim. Um, yeah. was just I think I'm trying to Sorry. Sorry. Why don't you go, go ahead, and again, let me hear you go back. No, I was just going to say that um, I was saying that the, there is language in there that allows an RFP um, to have a single bidder. RFP only results in a single bidder. That's an exception allowed to be awarded. And then it contradicts itself when it it's contra uh, yeah um, when it's talking about this right here, page two. But it seems like the minimum number of bids kind of goes away if you don't have if you only have one bid. I mean, I think I I think this is unclear enough that that if we do another two week push and don't get another application, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Oh, so what you're saying, Annikit, is that paragraph two of number two contract yeah. overrides the... Yeah, because it says over there at the beginning, um, sole source contracts, um, when there are extenuating circumstances, as is stressed in the so contract section, and that's one of the extenuating circumstances, RFP results in a single bidder. So that would override so that the would other override. language. Yeah, so, I, yeah. yeah. so I, think, I think that this does give an RFP of the other... I'm comfortable with yeah. this language and do another two push. Mia, sorry, I know you're you're trying to get in. That's totally fine. Um, just back to the proposal for a minute. I agree that it would be good to go out and try and get a couple more if we can. Um, I do want to point out that we're asking people to do a, a lot of work, and that, you know we want to make sure that they have enough time to do that work if they are interested. Um, I do a lot of work just for the proposal. And to that point, we actually put in the RFP that the our deadline for the board for determined for selecting our facilitator is actually not until the 19th of November. So we do have that time without having to push out our timeline too much. So all of that said, I think it makes sense and good sense to go out and, and ask for more um, if we can get it. And um, on the one that's in front of us, um, I agree, it is incredibly strong. I was very impressed with the thought and the level of detail that Nathan went to in designing the process that he would go through, as well as the intentionality and the how I can see him seeing that seeing the intentionality through in execution um, for the inclusion of so many different voices in the process. I was also really impressed with the letters of recommendation. And there's one piece of it that if everyone else on the board is okay with, I would like to go back and ask Nathan a question about, which is the timeline that he lays out. Um, it looks to me like he's planning on sending the board the final report um, at the end of the whole process in July. And what we wanted, and I think this is 
clear enough in the RFP, although as the person who made, wrote the first draft, I may be a little biased. What we wanted was that the, the report come to us more like in May, and then we have time before the full end of the scope of work, a couple of months, where Nathan will then actually work with the board to help us figure out what to do with the report. So I wanted to just go back to Nathan and ask him if he could, if there was a way to make that a little bit more clear or if whatever in his timeline, um, if that was all right with all of you. I, I think I think if we were to enter into a contract with Nathan, Mia, that would be what we should do for that contract. I don't know if we need to ask him to resubmit his proposal to do that. Does that make sense? Like, I think we could have a conversation. If he says, sure, that's no problem. We would just put that in the contract. Um, if, if that seems sufficient, I, I'm okay with that too. It makes me a little bit nervous to accept a proposal that has that, that that timeline laid out and then it feels like we're actually moving the goalposts on them later on so it feels better to do it right now but i, I don't feel that strongly I, yeah, I so fine. mia you probably didn't hear but nobody has a challenge to you asking nathan that would you like to reach out to him yeah i can do that My understanding of this, I mean, the way that it works in state government generally is we have a proposal. We might go back and forth with the contractor about that proposal, but it's really what goes into the contract that is like binding and substantial with regard to timeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can so we regularly have these kinds of conversations. Yeah. After a proposal, you can you can get into contract negotiations yeah. and, and finalize the contract. I would agree, but if it's reaching out, then yeah. so I was just throwing it out there to say potentially save some time. Yep. So we're gonna do another push, come back in two weeks, see how see if we got anything. Like uh, Mia is correct, we have until the nineteenth to decide. So we'll see where we're at in a couple of weeks. Um, so do we want to do we wanna I'm just looking at a calendar. November nineteenth is when when we're done. Is no November eighteenth is Thanksgiving, right? No, no. no. so we got twenty fifth. Thank you. I made a Two note to myself to change the due date my... on the RFP to 11 12, and then I will send okay. it. I'll do that tomorrow and then send it out, send you a link that you can send it to people. Does that 11... sound good? Thank you. To yeah. November 12th. Perfect. Okay. And, and then we'll decide at our on November 17th. Oh, it's okay. So November 17th. Yep. Yeah. Then we'll okay. decide that yeah. we, can, we can stay on the schedule that yeah. Mia gives Perfect. us. And the district is off that whole week, the 27th, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get me counting down. No, nope, not at all. Not just one day. Uh, um, okay, um, let me get back to my. Uh, So committee updates, uh, policy and finance. I think we can do these relatively quickly. Um, Emma, do you want to do policy? Sure. Um, the policy committee, uh, major news from our committee is that we thought that we were obligated to revise all policies and resubmit them um, this year, but that's not the case. We've consulted with Pietro. None of our policies have expiration dates on them. It's just best practice to review policies every three years. So we most likely will not get to all, and, and I think I think I'm correct in saying all of our policies, almost all of them need to be, you know, are up at the three year mark now. Um, so we are most likely not going to stick to that schedule and get all of them done this school year. Um, and we've forgiven ourselves for that. And <laughs> we've <laughs> talked to Pietro and he says that's legally fine. Um, so that's where we're at with that. We're sort of, we've prioritized and started to create a, a calendar and a schedule. And so we're, we're moving forward that way. Um, but there's also been some sort of organizational stuff and best practice issues that have arisen in our conversations around uh, revising policies. So we have dedicated some time to just take a step back, look at our best practices as a committee and, um, and sort of create some structure to the way that we are going to proceed. Um, and that includes, you know, sort of low level organizational stuff, um, high level organizational stuff, and then more like sort of values oriented things. 
So one of the things that um, we're gonna be actually putting before you at the next board meeting is something that the equity committee worked on. Mia's on the line, so she could maybe talk to that, but it's a equity framework that we're gonna be using as a tool to review when we review policies. We're gonna be using the framework. It, it requires a little bit of data entry and you know a close read on, on specific questions um, for every policy. And the reason why we've decided to bring it to the board um, I'm not sure logistically if it's going to have to be voted on or if it's just more of like presenting it to you. We'll have to see at the next meeting, but um, is because we, some of the policies we think it's appropriate to be having sort of the first revision process happen within other committees. So sometimes that might be the finance committee with the, this EO2 and EO1. Sometimes it might be a facilities committee. Sometimes it might be um, equity committee, whatever. So we're actually going to be asking those individual committees to be using this equity framework as well. Today, we talked about maybe creating an additional framework that we would use as like sort of a regular um, tool to be reviewing these policies. So we're gonna be looking at that stuff um, and then getting started again later this month or early November on our revision work. Um, Mia, did you wanna say anything about the equity framework tool? I'm excited to get started. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think that's it for the policy. Any questions? Policy? I, think, I, just, I, think, I think it's a great idea. And I ultimately, because policies will be going to different committees and also because policies get read before the full board like three times, um, I think having input from everybody on that and getting everybody on the same page is yeah. gonna be really helpful. Um, also, you know, if you guys have a vision for how it can be used, I think that's gonna be helpful for us to understand as well. So I'm, I'm excited. Great. I see the finance committee finance? is on here. Yeah, this, this will be very brief. Uh, we had a finance committee meeting earlier today, first quarter, we're in excellent shape, really, really excellent shape. Um, at this point in the year, it, you're just a quarter into the year and you like can't read too much into the numbers. It's, it's not until later in the year we'll, where we'll have um, more certainty surrounding what our actual expenditures are compared to the budget, but we're in excellent shape and Frankly, we've benefited greatly from uh, having Grant as our business manager over the years. He's done a tremendous job. And we get anybody who wants to take a look at those quarterly financial reports, you can get a really good understanding of pretty much all of our major financial positions just from reviewing that. And if anybody, if at some point you want to walk through that, I've heard some board members wanting to talk about it. I'm also happy to, I've been really busy lately, but. I'm also happy to carve out some time if somebody has questions um, to, to walk you through where we are with things and answer any questions. Um, so in, in general, very, we're in a very good situation. Also, we recently reviewed, as this board knows, but I'm just bringing this up again, Brett, because you're new, um, the, pol the finance committee reviewed a couple of financial related policies, which we're getting to in a minute and um we are sometimes involved in that way so yeah i think i think things look good any thoughts jill anecdote yet from today and in general all right thank you um so three policy readings um we made the one change to change families to family members. <laughs> um, there were a couple of those references. The two families? Yeah. Okay. I think I think there were like two in that paragraph. Oh, yeah. Unless I'm mistaken. I don't have it in front of me now. Later it says family member in section four. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's And I think three references of families and one family member. <laughs> yeah, so be consistent there. Mm -hmm. Immediate families may submit food. 
images. Although one of them might be a three. Um, yeah, no, the other the other references are for uh, yeah. tuition. Yeah, the other so that one. might be okay. Who's just saying? All right, are we talking about these right now? Are yeah, we, we can talk about them. It's basically any sort of changes, additions, comments you want to make during the second reading, you can put in and then... Um, the yeah, third reading is hopefully third reading and vote that same day. Exactly. Uh, it gets put in the consent agenda the next month. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I had a question about the under the bids and contracts section, um, bullet point one under bids, and then under um, oral quotations. It says that quotations may be received by phone or in writing, and I just wanted you to walk me through what it looks like to receive. A bid over the phone and how that becomes part of public record. So it would be the person who's taking that bid's notes of the conversation. That would be how it gets put in the public record. The only time I could imagine that happening is Andrew talking to a contractor who we might use quite a bit, you know, and, and saying, What do you got for me? That's yeah. the only time I could imagine it happening. So is there a value to have that in there? Do you think that, that that's valuable to be able to accept a bit over the phone? My hunch based on this particular policy or this particular policy is that that's language that has been given to us by the lawyers of the state, the lawyers or the, sorry, the lawyers of the VSBA who's, who've written this for us. Because mm -hmm. whenever a policy is of this length and has to do with a whole lot of statute, it's usually written by lawyers for the VSBA and then put up as a model policy. So that's where my hunch would be that the language comes from. So I don't know is yeah. the answer. <laughs> the I answer wonder if we could, I mean, to me it feels a little like, I mean, I think we're just trying to get away from any sort of thing that feels sort of under the radar insider, you know, and I feel like it's so easy to just send an email these days even if it's a super simple in writing. Yeah, and that's what practice is for us outside of this policy in general, that whenever we're having an important oral conversation, administration or directors follow up with an email saying, thank you for the conversation. These, this is my understanding of it. So it doesn't matter if we're talking to the teacher or we're talking, you know, like you generally follow that up. And then that would get comes into public record at, in the board packet when we're talking about bids or how would that probably, be probably accessed? It hasn't with, happened, so I'm not sure. <laughs> like with the construction bid, do construction bids ever come before the board? Or do they just get dealt with by the yeah. administration? Yeah. At, at, at a certain times, dollar yeah. amount. At a certain dollar amount, it comes before the board, I believe, in some way. How did you remember from your past history? We ever brought construction bids, specific construction bids before the board? Yeah, I think this is one of the first summers. Yeah. Yeah. In the summer and then we would bring them to all the committees and everything. Yeah. And then Andrew or and or Grant would say, I, I think the board should vote on this particular bid because is my room. We haven't done any major bids because the bond stuff was done prior to my time, which mm -hmm. is why I'm kind of waffling a little bit. I'm trying to think about when we've done that and I don't know if we've done any major bids since then. Do we want to maybe, this would have been a good question to ask Andrew and Grant when they were both here, actually. I know, I wasn't thinking about it. Um, I wonder, I, I feel like we're not going to get clarity on Yeah, is that something, Andrew, that you'd be willing to sort of follow up on? Yeah, I can. Um, or would you, or do you want me to, I don't know how it makes sense, because I know that you've been sort of taking the lead on this policy. I can do it. If you could follow up on that, I mean, yeah. I personally would feel more comfortable if it was just all in writing, but I mean, I do see that the next bullet point says that a record of these oral bids must be kept on file. You could put parentheses, parentheses e.g. email, because that's time stamped, right? If you want to clarify that the type of record that you want us to keep, does that make sense? Um, yeah. I guess I, yeah, I just don't know how it would work for if the public was sort of curious about our process in particular bidding thing, how they would normally access those. 
Would it be a public records request? Yeah. Or would they could file. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or they just ask. Or they just ask. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like reporters yeah. regularly make those types okay. of requests. So I just would like clarification around that. Thank and you. if there's a way for us to just um, get around oral bidding, feels like. Yep. Not yeah. Best I, practice. That was my only question. Any other questions or comments on the ribbon? Are we are we taking them one at a time or are we doing them all at once? I think we open them up all at once. Um, okay. The the one that I I have a small thing on animal dissection, which I think since we changed the language on our website from mandatory to required. I saw then um, we just need to change it on each policy as they come up for review. And the animal dissection one has mandatory at the top of it or mandated. So I think we just need to change that to required. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Thank you, Else? I think we need a motion. It's, 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 it's red, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we'll have a motion at the top. So, okay. um, I think we could have a motion to adjourn. Wait, are we at that point? We're at that point. But do we need to approve the, the policy? Nope. policy? Yeah, no. it'll all get approved at the third reading. Okay. I mean, the, Great. Yeah. The readings are just a, just basically an evidence. Okay, session. great. And then, and then we'll I move to adjourn. Do you have a second? Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Great. Have a good night.